Hi everyone, I'm George Favar, and welcome to Jax82, Jacksonville as it was in the year 1982. I'm pleased to bring you this year-by-year -year series of Jacksonville history spanning the years 1975 through 1995. And here we have an August 1982 picture of downtown Jacksonville looking towards the west. We see the old Gator Bowl. We see the old Jacksonville Veterans Memorial Coliseum. We see old Wolfson Park. Okay, since been demolished. And if you zoom in closer, and of course you see the Hart Bridge Expressway snaking its way into towards downtown, but to the right you see the old Gator Bowl since demolished. But if you look up just above the, the, the main bowl there, you see the construction being done on the upper uh, seating, and there were been uh, sky boxes that were being constructed. Uh, this was an improvement being done on our old, uh, on, that, on the Gator Bowl, okay? So I'll have some more and talk more about that uh, later. And I'll also tell you a little bit more about the construction of the Southern Bell Building. Here we see that construction underway. It was underway uh, in construction in 1982. This is before the Jacksonville Landing was constructed. Back when the Wells Fargo Center was the Independent Life Building. Of course, here we see the Main Street Bridge. We see what was at the time Jacksonville City Hall. And so we have so much optimism, I think, that inspires us on the river. So much going on. I'm going to tell you more about... Uh, downtown throughout the show so we see friendship fountain and and you know I think there's a lot of optimism and enthusiasm that gushes forth sometimes when we talk about Jacksonville and the river and a lot of the opportunities and the things that are going on and in 1982 we're really trying to I think locally trying to get things more off the ground. <laughs> Here we see a picture of JIA, Jacksonville International Airport, in October 1982. But it seemed though like we were playing stuck on the tarmac, at least economically speaking. Now this was years ago, but it's important to remember in 1982, there's a very big recession going on. And you see here, just look at the tops of the charts here. And you see uh, the top of uh, the, the, the highest peak uh, in the unemployment rate was in 1982. This is a, a chart that spans from 1947 to 2017. And it spiked unemployment, meaning people without a job. It spiked in 1982. And... Later on, of course, we see that it spiked during the Great Recession of 2008 uh, and then going on into uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, the economy later on recovering. So we see these in the economy, we see these bursts of activity, but then we see these big, uh, sometimes every once in a while, we see some substantial unemployment. And so this in a city can wreak havoc. People that don't have a job how can they afford to spend effectively to keep the community growing and, and also be able to sustain themselves, be able to live, be able to prosper, be able to enhance their houses, enhance their lives, build for the future. So people, as everyone tends to do, do of course look to the city leadership. And, and in this Ed Gamble uh, political cartoon, we see uh, uh, a, um, a cartoon of the city council and a city councilman here goes, what we need are some new ideas. And another one says, I recommend we send that proposal to a committee for further study. Now, the talk of the town back then was getting a convention center. And here we see in another Ed Gamble political cartoon, we see the problem that downtown Jacksonville was facing. Abandonment. Uh, in July 1982, the Holiday Inn City Center Hotel, which was where the Robert Mayer um, hotel had been and where the um, now where the the where the federal courthouse is today where the the United States Brian Simpson federal courthouse is today there was a, um, a hotel and that hotel closed so they laid people off 
And it says here, downtown Jacksonville, with the last visitor to leave, please turn out the lights. The idea being that we didn't really have a lot that was bringing, that could bring people downtown because a lot of places were starting to close. So what's going to happen if you're trying to get a convention center? So there was a lot of debate back and forth. Now, of course, we know that we got that convention center, didn't we? In 1982, the chairman of CSX Railroad, previously known as Atlantic Coast Line, Seaboard Line, he decided to lead an effort for us to have a convention center. This is a 2017 picture of our old Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Station. It served us as a railroad station from 1919 until 1974. And Prime F. Osborne III led this effort to revitalize old Jacksonville Terminal because this is what it looked like in 1982. Okay, folks, a different time. I sometimes call these times more raw times. In the early 1980s, I would, we would be going uh, down Interstate 95, headed south, and I could see the, the back end of the abandoned railway station. So here we see uh, a building, generally in, in uh, the downtown area, uh, that had seen better days. This is in the early 1980s. And in 1982, it was renovated. So there are things that are starting to happen in downtown Jacksonville, bit by bit, to bring life and bring vibrancy to the city. And nothing says vibrancy in Jacksonville like the Florida Theater. But the Florida Theater had closed in 1980. But in 1982, it would have the remarkable distinction of being put on the National Registry of Historic Places. And it wouldn't be, though, until 1983 when I would visit the Florida Theater for the first time and see the exquisite beauty. And we'll have more on that in the 80s on both of those in our 1980 series. Here we see Eric Clapton. He visited, performed in June of 82. Here we see a ticket to the Florida Georgia game, November 6th, 1982. No electronic tickets. You had to have, you must have a ticket. And here we see the Gator Bowl, 1982 Gator Bowl game, December 30th, 1982. Florida State, my alma mater, versus West Virginia, okay, and the newly constructed stand. So you see a lot is happening, but some things are happening faster than others. Hey, think about it this way. Even J.D. Salinger visited Jacksonville, okay, uh, the writer of Catcher in the Rye, uh, the book about teen angst, about turbulent youth. He visited the Alhambra Dinner Theater. Now, speaking of turbulent youth, I was in a rather tranquil part of town called Arlington, uh, a suburb of Jacksonville that had uh, grown big time in the 1950s and 1960s. And here I am in 1982, out at my grandmother's house, with my Yoda shirt on, playing Star Wars. I, I think my, uh, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was doing all sorts of stuff out there. Uh, in the yard, having fun. I had a great backyard on Morgana Road in Arlington. And uh, I, I was excited. And times back then, for me, towards the beginning of 82, were, were more simple. You know, I'd ride along with my family in the 1981 Thunderbird we had. Uh, and we were going all over the place on the weekends, particularly. Of course, I had school at Arlington Heights Elementary. And uh, now, pay attention to this. Think in your mind, keep in mind uh, what this 1981 Thunderbird uh, looks like, because later on, it's actually going to play a rather pivotal role on a very interesting day. So, 
And, you know, we would, on the weekends, you know, we'd go to the movie theater, because back then, you know, this was before VHS, VCR, though we had, we had Laserdisc, and we had, we had some, some things. But for the most part, we went, went to see movies, we went out to see them. Uh, and uh, we would go out to see the movies, and this is Town & Country Movie Theater, uh, off of the Arlington Expressway at University Boulevard in the early 1980s. I would see movies there. Now, now we get to Regency Square Mall. I've talked a lot about Regency Square Mall throughout my history series, and I'm going to talk about some very special moments I had uh, in the mall. Now, back then, I was so young and kind of, I was very rambunctious. And so it was like, okay, we're going out in public. You need to behave. We're going out in public. And it's like, are we going out in public? Yep, we're going out in public. And so every other Saturday, I was guaranteed to be going out in public because I would be visiting with my mother. Now, remember, uh, I with my, I was living with my, my father, my stepmother, and my half-brother. And my mother, Martha, uh, did not live with us cause, because my father and my mother had divorced. So I would still have these visitations with her. And they were called visitations. And, you know, we would... We would um, show up and, and we would go in uh, through the, uh, what you might call the main entrance, the Arlington Expressway side of the Regency Square Mall. Now, they had recently had an addition put in in 1981. A Sears had opened. The downtown Sears had closed and, and there was a new Sears. So there was this entire new wing uh, to the mall. And so there was a lot of walking we'd be doing, especially when the new uh, edition opened up in 81. Uh, a lot of walking, a lot of exercise, which is great, uh, you know. Um, and I had an opportunity, though, to spend a lot of time with my family. Now, sometimes it was not always the best of times because a lot of times when we first went, would go into the mall, it would be like, okay, it's time to go to Radio Shack, which is just seemed like, I think it's just right as you went in. My father would go towards the back of the store to locate whatever um, small parts he was trying to find for whatever um, personal computer project he was working on. He had these things called Heath kits. Uh, he, um, he really liked to do hands-on computer building work. Now, of course, though, I was into that. I wanted to be more towards the front of the store where all the fun stuff to me was. So it was one of those things. And of course, my mother, Martha, she really, really liked Furchigitz. And I, I enjoyed going with her to Furchigitz. I, I liked going into some of the stores because you would go into the store in some of these stores in the early 80s and they really, you really felt good. It was a really good vibe you would get. Uh, remember Mr. Dunderbacks? Remember Mr. Dunderbacks? I always wanted to go in there. I always wanted to go into Mr. Dunderbacks, and I didn't get the chance at this time in 82 to do it because I was hanging out a lot at the Woolworth. It's time to talk about the Woolworth, and the day, we're getting towards the day I'm going to tell you where it was a very, very interesting day. Uh, a, the core of our visits with my mother uh, would start, basically, we would meet at the Woolworth Luncheonette. A lot of times there was a waitress named Cindy, and so we would we would sit down at a table, and sometimes we would have food. Uh, so it depended upon what was going on on that given every other Saturday. Okay, so I'm getting this unique chance to be with my father, my stepmother, my baby half brother. John and my mother and here I'm showing you a visit Woolworth's luncheonette sign but we see uh, that you know Woolworth's really was it seemed like I think in history was a crossroads and there were the numerous conflicts from the sit-ins that would happen even one that happened in Jacksonville downtown the downtown Woolworth's you know civil rights people sitting in speaking out so I guess it makes sense that one of the biggest things that happened ever in my life uh, happened at a Woolworths luncheonette. And uh, <laughs> one day I went to Regency Square Mall and I arrived in the 1981 Thunderbird. 
And I left on a JTA bus because we sat down one day at the Woolworths Luncheonette, everybody, and my mother Martha had brought these activity books and with connect the dots and things like that. And I was sitting there at the lunch at the at the table. Um, I was sitting there trying to make sense of the connect the dots and there was some back and forth going on and, and I know that there had been there was some level of agitation. At age seven I was slow to connect the dots, so to speak. My mother wanted to spend more time with me, but the arrangements were what the arrangements were. Finally, something happened on that day, that special day. My father and my stepmother, sometimes as a team, had what one would say unconventional methods, but they were remarkably effective. Before I knew it, I found myself on a JTA bus with my mother. Here's the icon, of the logo of JTA from that time. Here you see what the bus looked like. Now, this is a MTA bus, a Dreamliner 60 bus. The buses back then were uh, 1960s style buses. They were old. They were old buses. Now, this bus would have said JTA on it. Uh, and it would have, I believe, if I can recall correctly, something like orange and beige and white. Uh, and they were very loud, very heavy, polluting, big buses. And uh, so before I knew it, I saw the taillights of the 1981 Thunderbird uh, headed away towards Mill Creek Road. And I looked standing out there right outside the Woolworths at Reed C. Square Mall, I looked at my mother and I went, oh my. So I got on the bus with her and I would spend that, I guess it was that Saturday night and Sunday with her. First, we went downtown, okay? Let's keep in mind that while I would arrive to the mall in the 1981 Thunderbird, she arrived at the mall on a JTA bus. So she was reliant mostly on the bus for her transportation. In the early 1980s, there was a lot of construction that was going on to provide pedestrian amenities, an attempt to really revitalize downtown. Now, I don't recall as much of the construction on that given day. I um, remember riding the bus. I remember the buses being around Hemming uh, Plaza, and I remember the water fountain, and I remember on Laura Street, there was a strawberry field store, clothing store, I think where the main public library is now. Now here we're looking at May Cohen's in what is now our city hall. These efforts to revitalize around the St. James building, though, I think ultimately failed because May Cohen's left, there was a store, a May Cohen store out at Regency Square Mall anyway, and a, out at Orange Park Mall. So they had stores, but it just was not practical for them to serve downtown anymore. So the St. James building went abandoned for a long time until it became our city hall. So we do see a winding down essentially of retail in the downtown area. Now, back to that special day. Uh, the Plymouth Home for Adults still stands on Plymouth Street, off the railroad tracks, in Murray Hill, near Edgewood. Now, my mother lived here for a period of time, the Plymouth Home for Adults, and so I would spend some time in 1982 here as a visitor. I would eat dinner with the people here. These two places, there was, um, at a certain point, it, there was a really nice, more of a more extensive porch, it seemed like back then, of course. Um, and, and it was different, of course. It was older. You see, this is more of a modern, this is a modern picture and a modern, refers first with lighting and sighting. It didn't look like this. It looked... 
I, it looked like it had been built in the 1930s, okay? We would sit on the porch and we would watch these freight trains go by. They look like this. Here's a train pulling out in 1982. And these trains, these freight trains, though, they had cabooses, which they don't have cabooses in operations on the railroads now. We would wave. Sometimes there would be a man standing as the train is moving. At the end of the train is this red caboose, and a man would be waving. Not always, but sometimes we, and we would wave from the porch. Unique times were going on. Okay, There were some extenuating circumstances and things that were going to change, and I'll talk about... 1983 and 1983, uh, but there's going to be a lot that's that's going to happen. And as we start to think towards 1983, take a look ahead at what would be the Southern Bell Building. Later on, it would become the Bell South Building, then the AT&T Building, then the Everbank Building, and now the TIAA Bank Building. Okay, maybe they were called Centers or Towers or whatever, however they called it and, and the corporate name was. Uh, I can remember construction being done on this building in the early 1980s. I lived on Morgana Road in Arlington, uh, across from the Barrens. Uh, I would stay over uh, at Ophelia and Pete Barron's place, uh, and uh, I was friends with Nikki Barron. And I remember Pete Barron, he smoked cigars. He was a construction worker on that construction site as that building was going up. And in the afternoons, I would ride over with Ophelia and Nikki to pick him up. Uh, so we'd go downtown, and we'd see all these construction workers flooding the streets at the end of the day, jumping into cars, tons of them. And you see this construction site and the skyscraper going up, okay? Lots of progress going on. And, you know, back then, you know, the people back then, teenagers, they liked to skateboard. Skateboarding was getting to be big. This indicates, looks like Lone Star Road. There was a lot of stuff going on uh, off towards Lone Star Road. BMX racing. Uh, there's uh, Kona uh, out on, um, also out off the Arlington Expressway later on. Uh, okay, and then uh, the Suns, okay, the baseball team. I remember going to a baseball game. Pick and save. Now, that was a unique Jacksonville institution, a retail institution. And I could talk for hours about pick and save, but I'm only going to talk briefly about it. I remember pick and save mostly because in the early 1980s, uh, we, when we had to go get stuff, that was like our Walmart, okay? That was like our Walmart, our Costco. That was where our family went. A lot of times, my dad, had, we had to get auto parts or get some little part or something for the house or whatever we had to get. And, and he would go there, and he would say, "Hey George, go over and talk to that guy over on over there, over there, over on aisle four, and ask that guy if they sell spark plugs. Go over there and ask him and tell me." And and <laughs> I remember, I remember all that well, and the fun of that, <laughs> and interesting interactions. And they had a, amazing cafeterias in these pick and saves all over the city. Southern cooking, okay, good, wholesome Southern cooking. But they went away, right, when Walmart came along. Now, before I go to our final story, I guess I think back to the meals I had with my family at the Pick and Save, the visits to these places throughout Jacksonville, and the times with my mother. Savor every moment you have with your family and friends when you can. So, okay, guard flag from rain. One day in 1982, I got really impassioned. I got really impassioned about the United States flag being in the rain because I had been taught flag etiquette at Arlington Heights Elementary. And so I was really riled up about it. And finally, I, with my stepmother, put together this editorial. It appeared on the editorial page in the Florida Times Union in 1982 and I'll read it to you now guard flag from rain I am seven years old and go to the Arlington Heights Elementary School on November 4th it was raining I saw the American flag out in the rain I learned in school to treat our flag nicely I don't like to see our flag in the rain it made me sad the flag is supposed to be taken in when it rains I hope people will take in the flag when it rains next time. 
Some of the places were in Arlington, downtown, at a naval base, and on Roosevelt Boulevard. I was a very opinionated youngster, and I think in 1982 that you can see that I was becoming more a part as a citizen of Jacksonville, and it was an exciting time. We had a lot going on, and though the economy was what it was, there was an enthusiasm and optimism that I think we can all recognize even today. I want to thank you for watching. Take it easy. See you later. Thank you.